Okay, well, it's seven o'clock. And as you know, at home, we like to start on time. So I'd like to welcome you. Hello, my name is Matt Binder. I'm the adult program coordinator here at the Schomburg Township District Library. Welcome to a very special event that I'm so excited about. This is our kickoff event for our new Office Hours series, where we talk to somebody who we think has a cool and interesting job. And we're gonna kick this off with Dr. Jingmei O'Connor. She is the assistant curator at the Field Museum uh, in the Paleontology Division. And because Dr. O'Connor is going to be talking about herself, I don't have to do much of an introduction, which is really nice for me. Um, here's how this is going to go. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. O'Connor. She is then going to talk about herself, get the basics out of the way, um, how she got there, um, what she does now. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about what she wants to do in the future. We'll see. Uh, the best part about this is that this is a conversation for all of us. So um, after or during her presentation, if you have questions for her, put it in the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll get rolling right away with your questions. Um, so that's how that's going to go. We've got it also on YouTube if you want to send the recording to your friends. Uh, let me talk really quick about two things that are coming up at the library that I think you should know about. Uh, the first is this Saturday, we are having another Repair Cafe. As you know, the Repair Cafe is something that started in the Netherlands that we are doing here in Schaumburg. They, uh, other places participate in Oak Park or Evanston. But basically, uh, we have volunteers from the community who are here to repair your items and the items that you bring in you learn how to fix. Um, it is a wonderful program that's going to be from 10 to 1 p.m. in our at our central library in the workshop on the main floor. Um, if you're going to come in with an item, uh, we ask that you register and then tell us what the item is so we can give you an idea of whether or not we can handle it. Um, our rule is one thing. If you can bring it in, you can and, and bring it in comfortably by yourself. We'll take a look at it. Uh, and the rule also is that you got to stay to learn how to fix it, because that's the whole point is to encourage everybody to get brave, fix, and uh, stop the cycle of just purchasing whatever new thing comes out, keeping your old thing, and um, doing what you can to keep things out of the landfill. So that's 10 to 1 Saturday. Um, and then the other one, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, the next day, Sunday. Uh, September 11th at 1.30, we are going to have Dean and Lainey Myers. They are a, uh, a couple. They have been performing uh, for many, many years. They are a fantastic show. Uh, we have brought them in for their contemporary Broadway show, and that also is going to be the kickoff to a new series we're going to have here called Sunday Sounds. Uh, one Sunday a month, we're going to be doing a live concert, and it's free. It's for everybody. Just register on our website. Let us know you're coming so we know how many chairs to put out. Uh, again, that's going to be Saturday, September 11th at 1.30. Um, and uh, you can register at schomburglibrary.org, or you can give us a call on the phone and talk to our info desk in person. Either way uh, works for us. And if you have any questions, you can always contact me, Matt Binder, uh, mbinder at scdl.org, 847-923-3394. Um, OK. That is enough for me. Let me turn it over to the person that we're here to learn about and the person we're going to be asking questions of, Dr. Jing May O'Connor. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you very much for inviting me to be here this evening. I'm really excited to talk to every, tell everyone a little bit about myself and then also hear what uh, interesting questions you have. So I am the uh, Associate Curator of Fossil Reptiles at the Field Museum, which means that I am the dinosaur curator for the Chicago area, which of course includes Schaumburg. So as a uh, curator of fossil reptiles, that means that I am a paleontologist and a paleontologist is somebody who studies ancient life. So, uh, you know, what does a paleontologist typically do? Well, I will say that um, the amount of time that we spend doing cool things like 
digging up T-Rex, uh, well, T-Rex in particular, I've probably spent like 0.0001% uh, of my career doing things like that. The vast majority of my time is spent in front of my computer, um, taking care of bureaucratic emails, writing manuscripts. But I think uh, this little, I don't know how you would describe it. Is it a meme? I don't know. That I found online that a fellow colleague had posted kind of sums it up better than I could. You know, in, in addition to writing manuscripts and taking care of emails, we get a lot of emails um, from people who are convinced that a circular rock that they found is a dinosaur egg and they want to know how much it's worth usually. And usually they're not very happy when you tell them it's just a circular rock. Um, sometimes it's not a rock. My personal favorite was when somebody told me that they had a dinosaur embryo and then sent me a picture of a dried up dead cat in a lunchbox. But, um, you know, jokes aside, uh, being a paleontologist, is a really awesome job. Now, um, on social media, my handle is paleontologista. Uh, it's something I came up with before social media when I was in grad school. Uh, I don't know why I came up with it. Actually, in grad school, I called myself myself paleontologista 5000, but I, I dropped the 5000 as I got older. So what does it mean to be a paleontologista? Anyone can be one. I guess it just means that you're doing everything that a paleontologist is normally doing, but you're doing it with your own unique style and uh, which, you know, um, or in uh, high heels with vertebrae for heels. I'm kidding. As anybody who knows me knows, I am more comfortable in sneakers and heels are for board meetings or photo shoots only. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, honestly, I don't think that I am very special. I was just raised to you know, be myself. It has been a journey and I'm going to share a little bit of that with you today. But I think one of the reasons I was asked to speak with you is because I don't look like your typical paleontologist. And here I, I googled paleontologist and this is what came up. So I am here to kind of help break the mold and tell, you know, help people realize that regardless of whatever ology you study, as long as you do good work and good research and be a good person, anything, nothing else matters beyond that. And you can be any kind of person that you like. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into paleontology and uh, my journey as a young paleontologist that brought me to the Field Museum and then tell you a little bit about my work there. So how did I get into paleontology? Now, you know, 99% of paleontologists will tell you that they have wanted to be a paleontologist since they were like three years old. Basically, it's their earliest memory and uh, they've stuck with it, which is pretty impressive if you think about it. Now, nothing against this child here, that's my nephew, uh, but I was not one of these kids. Uh, as a child, I wanted to be a witch. And uh, unfortunately, that's not a viable career option. So um, I got into a geology through my mother. She originally was a stay-at-home mom uh, raising four kids and we were a handful, but uh, my dad is an artist and we didn't have a lot of money. So my mom decided to go back to school to help support the family. And so she uh, took the graduate, graduate readiness exam, which you take uh, before you go to grad school, and which, well, now has sort of been eliminated. So lucky, the younger generation is much luckier than myself and my mom. But my mom ended up getting almost a perfect score, despite the fact that she had these four kids. And so this really opened the doors for her to get into, you know, get a scholarship and uh, get into any graduate program that she wanted. And so uh, last minute, she decided not to pursue a more practical degree, but to do geology, which was always her passion when she was young. And, uh, and this is definitely one of the most important lessons that I learned from my mom. So uh, as she was doing her PhD, you know, she would take the family out with her into the field when she was doing either collecting samples for her research or doing reconnaissance for field trips that she had to teach. And, um, you know, you can see from this picture that, you know, I'm kind of less than enthused, but, uh, you know, I really didn't have 
any uh, strong interests of my own at the time. I was really into, you know, drawing, you know, art, but uh, my mom really didn't want one of her, uh, us, one of her children to follow our dad and be an artist uh, because she saw it as uh, not a good career option. There was, you know, it's very difficult to support yourself as an artist. So I decided to, when I went to school, when I went to college, I went to Occidental College. Uh, here's the geology building here. And I was the only declared geology major. But really, I chose geology because I just didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my mom was already a geologist. And I had taken some college level geology classes in high school. So I said, sure, why not? I'll do geology. But I really hadn't found a passion within that field. It was just kind of like a, a default decision because I didn't really know what I wanted to do at the time. Now, my decision to go to Occidental College, uh, which is in LA, not far from my parents' house, was purely a financial decision. Uh, you know, I looked at all the schools that I got into. This one gave me the best uh, financial aid package. And so that's where I went. And this turned out to be a really awesome decision because there at Occidental College, I met uh, my future mentor, Donald Prothero, who is himself a paleontologist. Uh, so he introduced me to this field for basically the first time. And Donald Prothero was, is an amazing teacher. And I, I found this quote online um, from Albert Einstein, and I think he really encapsulates this quote, which says, it is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. And honestly, I did not have that until I met Dr. Prothero and before I started taking his classes. But, uh, you know, his vibrant, uh, and passionate lectures and, uh, and, you know, and the jokes that he would incorporate into it really had me falling in love with the idea of evolution. And if you are already a geology major and you're going to study evolution, the lens through which to do that is paleontology. And so one thing that I, I really loved about him is he would always wear these t-shirts that were clearly like, he, he had clearly got these t-shirts when he was in grad school or something and he still had them. And he would wear t-shirts that would match the lectures that he was giving. So um, my personal favorite was this one, the support Darwinian evolution destroy weakling today. It's a joke, uh, uh, but I guess PC culture frowns upon such jokes now because you can't get that t-shirt anymore. But here's another one that you still can't, you still Still can buy, which is like a geology joke that says subduction leads to orogeny, which means a plate subducting leads to mountain building. So I told uh, Dr. Prothero right away, you know, I want to be a paleontologist like you. You know, I, I've fallen in love with the subject and this is what I want to do. And so he gave me the lecture, which any young aspiring paleontologist who has emailed me can confirm is a lecture that I will give also which is basically the don't do it. Uh, it's extremely competitive. There's no jobs, uh, you know, like it's not a good idea. So at least that way, if you make the decision to be a paleontologist, it is an informed decision and you know what you're getting yourself into. So uh, I told him, I don't care about any of these things. I don't care about never making a, making a lot of money or any of these more practical concerns. I want to do what I'm passionate about. So. After he warned me and let me know what I was getting myself into, he then threw himself into providing me and several other students who are interested in paleontology all the resources that he what that were it was possible for him to share. So he, you know, taught um, extra classes that are normally not taught. He, like we have paleontology that was offered at Occidental College, but he also designed and taught a vertebrate paleontology course just for us. He hired us as his field hands uh, during the summer and took us to all these different fossil localities all over the Western United States to collect samples for paleomagnetic research, but also just to really give us a really wonderful experience and uh, become acquainted with the fossil deposits in, in Western uh, North America. And uh, he, you know, even went as far as when we were applying for grad school to make a list of every single paleontology program in the United States and let us know all the little ins and outs of these particular programs, a lot of information, which is things that are not easily available online, uh, and really helped us to make a very good informed decision of where to go to grad school, which is ultimately the most important decision that you're going to make 
in your life if you uh, pursue academia. Uh, so on his recommendation, he told me to start volunteering at the Natural History Museum in LA in the fossil prep lab, where I learned the ins and outs of fossil prep, how to make molds and casts, the basics of paleontology that everybody needs to learn. And again, if you're a young aspiring paleontologist, this is what I've told you to do for sure. And uh, he also contacted everyone in the LA area who worked on Chinese fossils because I was really interested in my Chinese uh, culture. I was really interested in the amazing fossils that were coming out of China at the time. And I wanted to combine my interest in China with my newfound interest in paleontology. So uh, he contacted all these people, but the only person who responded was Dr. Wang Xiaoming, who is the curator of fossil mammals at the LA Natural History Museum. And he gave me specimens to work on for my undergraduate thesis. And uh, Don Frothro encouraged me to apply for grants, which is also a very important skill to learn as a aspiring paleontologist. And I was able to get research money to then do field work in China, uh, which was a really awesome experience. Uh, volunteering at the prep lab, I also got to meet the curator of dinosaurs, Dr. Luis Chiape, and he then uh, invited me to join him uh, in the summer for an expedition to uh, excavate a T-Rex named Thomas in a small town called Igalaca in southeastern Montana. And I actually was just in that same town just a, a month ago doing field work there again, almost 20 years later. So uh, I got into a couple grad schools uh, and in the end, I chose to go to U University of Southern California and work with Luis Chiape uh, on Mesozoic birds. So basically he said, if you come to your PhD with me, you're gonna work on Mesozoic birds. And this is the where my, my practical decision came in because I had uh, uh, several other options of different groups I could have worked on and worked with different people. But uh, I knew that it was very difficult to make it as a paleontologist. And at the time, and even continuing now, there were these spectacular discoveries of beautifully preserved early Cretaceous birds, like the ones you can see here that are being uncovered in Northeastern China. And this was an area of the fossil record that was growing very quickly. So I thought if I work on this area of research, it will allow me to make an impact in the field, which will make it more likely that I'll be able to be successful. So even though maybe a lot of this journey has been one of doing something that I'm passionate about, I've still tempered that, I guess you could say, with some practical <laughs> decisions here and there. So um, if you want to work in Mesozoic birds, the place to do it is in China, like 99% of all specimens come from from these uh, 130 to 120 million year old deposits in northeastern China. Half of all Mesozoic species of birds come from China. And to uh, give you an idea so that you can really appreciate just how spectacular these specimens on the screen are, here is the holotype of a Cretaceous bird from Montana. Uh, and this is actually, you know, not a bad specimen. You have a whole bone a whole single bone and it's pretty nicely preserved you know but there are species of mesozoic birds that have been named from less than a single bone so i mean can you imagine what it's like trying to understand the biology the physiology the you know how how it moved etc of an extinct animal when all you have is one bone or sometimes even less. So what you can do when you have these spectacularly preserved specimens like the ones from Northeastern China that are complete, articulated, sometimes preserving soft tissues, you can really learn so much more about these animals. So I um, focused on Mesozoic birds for my PhD and also continuing from then. And uh, as part of my PhD, I Lived, I moved to China for one year, did a year abroad. And then after I got my PhD, I moved to China to do a postdoc, uh, intended to just be there for a couple of years and then do a postdoc, you know, in, in Brazil and another postdoc in Germany and travel all around the world. I love to travel. But in the end, these, you know, the wonderful research situation in China, uh, it was so great that I just couldn't tear myself away. So I ended up living in China for uh, 10 and a half years. And working in China was amazing for so many different reasons. I mean, not only was it just a wonderful adventure, a beautiful place to live. Here's where I worked at the institute called the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. 
a really cool place. It's IVPP or joking like the IVPP. <laughs> Sorry, I love puns. Um, but yeah, working in China, doing academia in China is completely different than academic the academic environment here in the United States. So, uh, you know, here in the United States, we're being plagued by science denialism, which means that we have to do a lot of outreach that takes up a lot of our time. It's not a problem in China. There is no science denialism. So you don't need to do all this outreach to be like, science is real. So I actually got to spend pretty much all my time doing research. And I also had thousands of the best fossils in the world at my fingertips to work with. And because the Chinese government supports science, unlike the American government, there was tons of research um, money available for us to attend conferences all over the world, for us to go see collections in remote parts of the world, which I never could afford to do when I was a graduate student at in the United States. And beyond that, there isn't um, this misogyny that you also have in academia in the United States. There isn't the racism that you have in in society that you have in the United States. So China really provided this really wonderful environment that nourished me as a research scientist. But what I would say is actually more important is that China also, you know, like gave me the freedom to discover myself. So actually recently I was, uh, I was in London and I was visiting a friend and he's a gay man and he had come to visit me in Beijing and we were talking about his visit and he said, I have never felt as free as I did when I visited you in Beijing. And I was like, yes, you know, that really captures how I felt there. I felt free of judgment. And that's not because nobody's judging you. It's because as a foreigner, you're seen as an outsider, not in a negative way, but you're seen as different. So it doesn't matter how different you are, you're always gonna be seen as different, which frees you to be anything that you want. And so I had always suffered from anxiety and um, a little bit of depression, rather, more than a little bit of depression uh, when I was in college and in grad school. But in China, it really gave me the freedom to work through my issues and discover myself. And honestly, I think that's more important than all the research money and all the amazing fossils in the world. So uh, living in China, I you know, was able to, I guess, really become like fully embody this person, paleontologista. And then uh, in 2000, the end of 2019, I got the job at the Field Museum and I had to put my pants back on, if you will, because suddenly you're in this much more, um, you know, you're in a role that has a much more public facing side to it. And uh, this new role came with a lot more responsibilities. Instead of just being left to my own devices to pursue my research in any direction that I chose, also um, mentoring students and postdocs. At the Field Museum, I have a lot of a much more diverse set of responsibilities. Uh, a lot of outreach is, um, is expected of me, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. So I really don't mind. And I get to do some cool things. Like recently, I was invited to like the Chicago Comic Con to be part of a panel. Uh, as, you know, that has to be the coolest outreach that I've ever done. I still like dressing up. And uh, now I also lead an active field program, whereas in China, foreigners can't really lead their own um, field programs. Of course, I would do field work, tagging along with different friends, both in China and in other places around the world. But now I have to lead my own program and also work with exhibits and do lots of administrative administrative duties at the Field Museum, boring stuff, but things that are very necessary. So in addition to these new roles uh, that I have that are beyond just my academic pursuits and my research. Uh, I also, in my academic pursuits, are now have expanded my research interests, I guess. So before in China, I was really working only on meso birds and the dinosaurs most closely related to them, because that's how you understand how flight evolved within this group of small feathered dinosaurs. Uh, so now I'm working on things like tyrannosaurids, like here we are at the University of Chicago, CT scanning a juvenile gorgosaur, which is a type of tyrannosaur that was actually collected 100 years ago and never studied. It's a beautiful specimen, so stay tuned. And we're CT scanning it here. 
and uh, and actually recently had my first paper on Sue the T-Rex that just got uh, accepted a couple weeks ago. So that will also be coming out soon. So um, some of you may have heard in the, in the media, I guess it would have been probably about five years ago, they talked about how they finally figured out maybe how Sue died. Um, and there were these holes in the jaw that it was hypothesized were formed by a protozoan that also affects living dinosaurs, that affects birds, and also can cause the death of, of, of birds by actually by um, starvation, because it causes their throat to swell up and then they can't eat food and they die. Sounds awful. Uh, but in this paper that we just had accepted, uh, we show that these holes in the jaw actually show signs of healing. Uh, and this amount of healing, these little bone spurs that are growing back in there indicate that whatever caused this wound must have happened at least a year before Sue died. So Sue, and also, you know, in this detailed analysis, we show that the interpretation that it is a protozoan infection does not actually fit with the data. What caused these holes? No clue, to be honest, but it wasn't a protozoan and it probably didn't cause the death of Sue. So we, you know, don't have to imagine Sue starving to death anymore, which is nice. But uh, deep down inside, I'll always be a, a bird person. I really enjoy my research on birds, but at the Field Museum, we don't really have a lot of Mesozoic birds. So we do have a, a wonderful collection of Cenozoic birds that are about 52 million years old. And, you know, back in the day, I used to be real snobby and say, I only work on Mesozoic birds. But now I find myself um, also expanding my research interest to also include uh, younger birds, crown birds, as we call them, which are... Um, you know, they're, they're all right. They're, they're not, a, they don't hold a special place in my heart like Mesozoic birds, but it is always important, I think, in a career to learn new things and study new groups. So I'm always appreciating the challenge. And also, unfortunately, China is still cut off due to the pandemic, but I still have colleagues in China who are sending me samples. For example, we extracted a little tooth of this very cool early Cretaceous bird called Longipteryx, and they sent me that, and they've also sent me some other. Um, you know, samples that I can then analyze at the Field Museum and surrounding institutions. So um, that is basically a summary of how I got here to be your dinosaur curator and um, the things that I'm currently working on. So thank you so much for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, would you prefer that I call you Dr. O'Connor or would you prefer me to call you Jing Mei? Jing Mei is fine. Jing Mei. All right. Cool. Um, you covered so much. I have so many questions. Okay. Um, here, here's my first one. Um, how many languages do you speak? Were you fluent, fluent in Mandarin or Cantonese or really great at charades? How did you get through in China? Um, so actually, uh, well, I mean, I lived there for 10 years. So if I didn't learn some Chinese, uh, it would be like pretty shameful. But I am not really good with languages. So I'm going to admit that I'm really good at memorizing. So wherever I go, I usually pick up a few words and that, you know, tends to impress people. I don't know why. But yeah, my Chinese <laughs> is pretty bad. Uh, I mean, I could get by for sure. But in China, you would find people who um, have lived in China for like 15 years and still speak like five words. And then you have people who've lived there for a, a year or two and they speak fluent Chinese, right? So I was like right in the middle, which is rare. You know, that usually people are either one or one of the two extremes, but China is actually a really easy place to get around if you don't speak the language because everything is in English. Like you're on a bus, it's in English and Chinese, like every street sign, English and Chinese. And, um, and also people are very, uh, you know, friendly. So you can very easily like whip out a calculator and start bargaining with people. And then, you know, as the years went by with the advent of all these new technologies, then you could just speak into your phone in English and then it would translate <laughs> into Chinese and you just show it to them and, and then they would do the same thing on their phone and you could just have, have whole conversations that way. So uh, I wish I was better at languages. I wish I had picked up Chinese. I wish my mom just taught me Chinese as a child. That would have made things a lot more easier. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately my Chinese is, uh, it's high <laughs> Yeah. Hey, as long as you know some of your key phrases, that's, you, you can get by. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
so let me ask you in, you said in your work that you're really fascinated about the transition of um, creatures from what we consider dinosaurs to birds, to modern, to modern birds. So um, it seems like a lot of that is also tied up in your interest in reconnecting with your Chinese heritage. So kind of what came first? Was it, I'm interested in digging up dinosaurs in China or I'm really interested in these flying birds just happen to be coming from China? Yeah, I, um, you know, like I was always interested in my Chinese heritage growing up. Uh, my mom, you know, we like celebrated all the Chinese holidays and, uh, you know, and, and I loved it. And we ate almost all Chinese food, and used chopsticks every day. So I was raised very Chinese. Uh, and then, and so I always had that fascination. And so in, in college, I was learning Chinese formally for the first time. And then at the same time, learning about paleontology and learning about like the one animal I remember in particular was the discovery of Microraptor, which happened when I was in college. And it's this small dromaeosaurid dinosaur that has wings and its arms and its legs. And I was like, wow, like that is so cool. And there's these amazing fossils coming out of China. So I can then combine these two interests. And um, yeah, so it was really like my love for China came first. And then, um, you know, the fact that all these amazing fossils were being discovered there just kind of made it work out perfectly. Yeah, brought it all together. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. very nice. Um, you know, you had talked earlier about um, the talk that every budding paleontologist gets about the field, which is um, you better have enough passion to keep yourself going uh, in this field, um, which I think a lot of other fields um, have as well. Uh, that are kind of more academically based. Yes, they have some way to turn it into a private profit, but mostly this is just going into a journal that other academics are going to read and then build more research on. So let me ask you this, how do you balance that passion between being a paleontologist and then some of the more um, challenging aspects and banal aspects of your job? Well, um, you know, like there's that, uh cliche that they say like you know do something you love never work a day right mm -hmm. uh and you know so with paleontology that's kind of how it is but the fact is it's still work right so even if you love your job there's going to be aspects of it that you don't like but if you look step back at the big picture i spend a lot of my time doing things i like and of course, there are a few, you know, things that come along with it that I don't particularly enjoy. And you just have to accept that, right? Like, you, I don't think you're ever going to find a job that feels like play all the time because it's, it's not realistic. <laughs> so, um, you know, but when I was in China, it honestly felt like play almost all the time. You know, it was just unfettered research, unfettered resources, uh, wonderful fossils. I mean, you know, maybe the only time, you know, it, it wasn't was less than pleasant was when you you know, have, the, if you know academia, there's a the jokes about reviewer two, which is, you know, always, you know, not a very nice person usually. And so, you know, that, that can be kind of difficult to deal with, but now definitely that I, uh, you know, I'm at the field museum and I have a lot more admin duties and stuff. There's a lot more of these banalities as you called it, but, uh, but I'm still really grateful to be able to do paleontology for a living because it is extremely competitive. They say that like one in a hundred students makes it. So, um, and, and a lot of times they don't give people that talk because it is a money making machine. People who are like, I want to study dinosaurs for my job. And they're like, yeah, sure, sure. Come, you know, be a student. And they know full well that most of these students will never get a job and we'll have to eventually learn to do something else. But, uh, but as long as they can, you know, have you pay to go to school, they, they're profiting from it. So it is, um, uncommon that I think that people get that talk. So that's why I feel it's really important. And it's, you know, my, to also share that with other aspiring paleontologists. And I'm not trying to discourage them. I just think it's really important to get into this field, knowing what you're getting into, knowing that if you want to make it, you probably have to work 60, 70 hours a week. Uh, you might not have any hobbies. Um, you might not be able to, you know, like there's, there's trade-offs, right? Like one of the reasons I was able to be so successful is like put off having kids, you know, but, uh, and, uh, you know, paleontology is a white male dominated field. And so it's much easier for men to just be like, Hey, wifey, you take care of the kids. I'm going off 
to Mongolia for a month, but that's not something that women can do as easily, right? So, um, you know, you, you can't have it all and you have to recognize what sacrifices you're going to have to make if you really want to be somebody working at at least an R1 institution. If you're, you know, if you settle for something less, you know, um, demanding, then sure, you could probably have a life. I don't have a life. I have no hobbies. I work all the time, you know, but I love what I do. So it's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my next question was work-life balance, but you just answered that because there is none and that's great. Do you think that there's a concern within the field about that? That eventually people are going to just, the advice is going to be, don't do this. Well, um, you know, I think as long as we have science denialism issues, paleontology is important because it is what we call a gateway science. So it's, we need paleontology, something that interests people, that draws people to science. We're also now facing the sixth, the Earth's sixth mass extinction. So it is more important now than ever to study paleontology and to learn from past mass extinctions, to understand how species, what makes species vulnerable to an extinction? How, what, what are the um, different, uh, what, what causes it, like mass extinction selectivity? Why do some animals survive when others don't? These are, this is really important information for us to know now, now more than ever. So I would argue that paleontology is actually now becoming something that's far more relevant so we should hope that there should be more paleontologists in the future, but unfortunately, our society also seems to be regressing away from science as a whole. So most of most science that's funded these days, or there where there are jobs, is in the private sector. You know, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals, that kind of thing, which isn't necessarily a good use of science. But um, yeah, so it's just a, it's a it's a very complex situation that we're in right now, where we have you know, where we're actually seem to be moving backwards, you know, away from knowledge, like with science denialism and, and the fact that, you know, we do see less and less monetary support for science coming from the government. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it is a tough time to be a scientist, but it's also a really important time to be a scientist. Oh, absolutely. And um, I think your point, again, being that within your field, you have I'm going to be a little punny here, mountains of evidence uh, that yes, extinctions happen on this planet. Um, here are the facts that we have, and we are going to be facing one at some point as a species, because every species on planet Earth has. Um, but uh, let's move away from full our extinction. Let's talk about another extinction. Uh, these, these, um, Mesozoic birds. Um, so what it is about specifically Mesozoic birds that really captured your attention? So, um, you know, I, you know, people talk about like charismatic animals and non-charismatic charismatic animals. And I, I, I call BS on that. You know, I really think that any organism, once you start investigating it once you start learning about it you're going to be like that's weird you know like every organism has some fascinating story to tell and I got into birds purely by chance like I had no interest in birds prior to going to grad school but I was told like I had several options like I said one of them was to study birds that one seemed to be my best bet uh, of being successful so I took it and in learning about birds. I have since fallen in love with them and found them to be fascinating animals. But, uh, but what I really, really like in paleontology are the animals for which there's nothing like it alive today. So birds, you know, like, yeah, like they're, they're, they're everywhere. Like, you know, birds are the most diverse group of uh, land vertebrates on the planet right now. And yeah, the birds I study, you know, they've got teeth and they've got claws on their hands and some of them had long reptilian tails, you know, so I'm trying to be like, yeah, they're different, you know, but like, they're just, they're birds, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I find them fascinating. I find them beautiful. I love to understand their evolutionary story, but, uh, but, but what I really love, you know, are animals like, plesiosaurs or pterosaurs, something that is there's just nothing like it alive today, or like this group of dinosaurs that I love, the Scansoriopter ridges, these like tiny little 
flying squirrel dinosaurs. I mean, they're just so bizarre and, and really bizarre animals really test your ability to try to understand what the morphology is telling you. And in fact, a lot of times it's really difficult because you don't have any living analogs. And something I've really observed in my you know 15 years of being a paleontologist is that the human imagination is so limited. So we look at living animals and then we try to use what we see alive today to understand these animals from the past. But 99.9% .9 of all life that has ever lived on this planet is extinct. So what we're looking at alive today is just one tiny, tiny fraction of what you know, evolution can produce, of what organisms can exist. So, uh, so you're obviously so limited, you know? So, I mean, yeah, birds are great, but what I really love in paleontology are these these mysteries, you know, these enigmas that really test your ability to to take to draw evidence out of these fragmentary fossils and try to figure out what it all means. Yeah, I, I've always found it fascinating how um, paleontologists can weave that kind of narrative. And I've always wondered if it's because um, they were looking for ties that are in either other eras or in our current era, because I mean, we're still discovering species of animals on our planet now. So, um, yeah how how does how does that kind of agreed upon narrative happen with paleontologists? With it being so competitive, do you just have people who are like, nope, this is exactly how this was, and other people who are like, no way, this is how it is? Um, go ahead. Well, the more bizarre the group is, the more researchers will disagree with each other. For example, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I think pterosaurs are really cool, I'm kind of glad I don't work on them because pterosaur people, you know, like they're at each other's throats and there's really differing opinions and they, you know, I mean, there's just not a lot to go on. So like it's, I mean, the pterosaur research world is crazy, you know? And so I, you know, I'm glad not to be drawn into that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there, it depends on the group and, and, you know, in different groups, there are very, very disparate opinions and hypotheses about what these certain animals, groups of animals were like, because we have so little information to go on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but in the area of birds, um, it's, it's not quite, it's not, uh, there's not so much controversy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes sense. Um you know, you've already talked about so many things that you were excited about that are going on, but is, is there anything else in your, in your specialty or in your field that you've been really just enthused about? Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I guess you, I mean, I'm really excited about all the work I do, you know, like I really love doing research, no, you know, something small, it doesn't matter, like just trying to look at these beautiful fossils, and try every fossil, look at it and figure out well, what is this fossil telling us? And why does that information matter? You know, how does it connect to the information from other fossils? Like, I mean, this is like a game for me, you know, it's like, like a, a mystery, you know, like, and maybe it's not a thriller because everything is dead. And, mm. you know, there's, you can just stop, step away from it and nothing's going to happen. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I really can't say like to me that there's one thing that's more exciting than one mystery that's more exciting than another, you know, like, sure. like, for example, um, you know, I've always worked on birds, but now I come to the field museum and we have see the T-Rex and it's encouraged that we should, you know, work on it right so I you know started working on these they the, the miss these these jaw holes and uh, yeah now I'm really like you know really like into trying to figure out like how did these holes form you know and honestly like I, I'm kind of stumped you know this recent paper is like just saying well we know it's not the last hypothesis we can disprove that but then my co-author is like well then what then what are they and he thinks they're bite marks. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, and in the paper, you know, it's like there maybe they're bite marks, but that hypothesis doesn't work for all those reasons. That's the part I put in there. Um, but yeah. at the same so, but then he's like, Well, then what are they? And I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, so uh, and and it's like it's a mystery that I had never thought about when I was working on birds, you know, something that I yeah. just yeah, you know, because there's so much information out there, there's so many different groups out there to study and you can't work on all of them, right? So most academics will focus on one very narrow part of the tree of life. Like for mm -hmm. me, it's the 
penny raptoran dinosaurs, which are dinosaurs that have penaceous feathers, feathers like you see in modern birds. So they're the dinosaurs most closely re related to birds and also birds, of course. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I didn't really know much about T-Rex. And then I came to the field museum, started learning about it. And I'm like, that's pretty cool, you know? And there's also like a whole new set of mysteries that I wasn't even aware of. So um, yeah, I think that's one, that's one thing I really like about the new job is that it's given me the opportunity to work on so many things that I just never thought about before. Like I'll have students come to me that are like, I work on these microsaurs. Will you advise me? And I'm like, didn't know what a microsaur was before. <laughs> now I know like, oh, they're weird. Yeah, yeah, cool. Let me learn about this, you know? And so like now I'm also like giving, getting all these cool opportunities to learn all these new things alongside all these different students who approach me. And, um, and yeah, and that's, that's really exciting and, and really fun. And yeah. That's great. Wow. Um, now we've talked a little bit about how um, the fictional representation of dinosaurs may have set our knowledge back about them. Um, however, I, I, I'm curious to know what is your, favorite and this doesn't mean accurate but your favorite depict fictional depiction of dinosaurs i think i when i was a kid like so i i did not like dinosaurs as a kid right i mean mm -hmm. i didn't hate them but i just was not like oh my god dinosaurs right uh but i really loved that tv show the dinosaurs or mm -hmm. dinosaurs yeah mm -hmm. um which you know when you look back on it you're like they were all different species totally didn't make any sense. Uh, but yeah, like I, I remember really liking that TV show. I mean, I haven't seen it in like 20 years or more than 20 years, probably. I also really loved Land Before Time as a little kid. And there I was obsessed go. with the little pterosaur Petri. That mm -hmm. was my, my favorite. And I also have not seen that since I was probably like five years old, but I've been meaning to rewatch it. So uh, yeah, those are- There's those only are like favorite. what, 30 some movies in the Land Before Times? There is- Oh, it, there's really? way more Land Before Time movies than you can possibly imagine. You think wow. there's only two or three? <laughs> there's like 15. It's crazy. They um, just never stopped <laughs> making them. <laughs> hey, that Land Before Time, there's a lot of time. Um, and okay. Well, quite honestly, I think that was, I mean, that was it for, for my questions. I'm not seeing any of the Q&A in chat. Um, but I think for my last question, um, I uh, I took a look at your website, obviously, before we logged on, just to make sure we have a couple of things. And I noticed that you have a book coming out soon, a I children's do. book. Can you can you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So um, so the Field Museum does this weird thing where our the researchers have ten month salaries, so they're like fend for yourself for two months. So I was like, all right. So so one last summer, I was like, I'm gonna. I got approached by a publisher. Uh, to write a children's book. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And uh, and actually, yeah, I really enjoyed it, you know, and, um, you know, not only do I get to like share all these cool stories about, you know, about the evolution of birds, about the evolution of feathered dinosaurs, about how we are able to learn about them, like how do we know about what color feathers were and all these things. Like um, I also at the end uh, was able to kind of plug something that's actually more important to me than paleontology. Uh, and that's really, um, you know, preserving the environment for the future. So I am very passionate about the environment. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I guess you could say I'm kind of a pain in the butt, but I just like really don't understand when I see my colleagues around me, it's like, how can you care so much about uncovering all this information about the past? If you're not going to preserve the environment for the future. And I, I really don't understand it, but everyone are like, I, you know, I, I've recently basically reached the point when I go take expeditions that I'm like, look, I can't stand how wasteful we are. So now I just like have to be that annoying person who's like no plastic water bottles, like no, you know, like, we, yeah, we just have to no single use plastics, period. And just really, you know, because what is the point of us going out? if we're just, you know, going to trash the environment, like what, I, don't, I just don't understand the point. So anyway, sorry, I'm kind of like getting a little riled up there, but, um, but yeah, so basically at the end of the book, it kind of goes into the sixth mass extinction. Cause of course you deal with the fifth mass extinction and the loss of not of non-avian dinosaurs, plus all these other cool groups of birds that I did my PhD on. And then, but you know, birds survive and they radiate and you have all these cool Cenozoic birds as well. Some of which, you know, many of which have went extinct obviously. And then I go into the sixth, sixth mass extinction. And the last spread of the book is about like, you know if we are the cause of this mass extinction, which we are, then we can also be the solution. 
And uh, it's something that I'm, that I, I want to believe, you know, I'm not saying, it, you know, if, if it's going to be true, we, it's going to take an enormous effort on every individual's part. And, uh, but in, I wanted to end the book on that positive note, but also share with people ways that they can help the environment and shift the way that we interact with the environment by thinking about every time we consume something, what is the impact? And then shifting how we consume. And I was, it was kind of funny because I was like, are they going to let me do this? Like they want people to buy this book. And I'm like, capitalism is bad. <laughs> you know? So I was like, Oh, you know, but yeah, yeah. They, they totally let me do it. And um, yeah, so that's really what I'm like, you know, that, that's why I'm actually really grateful that I was able to do this book because that's actually a really, really important message that I I really want to share as widely as possible. So yeah, the book is beautifully illustrated. Um, you know, I like it. I hope other people like it. It's going to come out on November 1st, but you can already pre-order it. It's called When Dinosaurs Conquered the Skies uh, by Porto, Porto Kids Publishing Group. So um, yeah, like check it out and let me know what you think. I, in the last slide of my presentation, I included my email because um, I know sometimes it's difficult for people to come up with questions on the spot while I'm here conversing with everyone. But um, I do encourage people to reach out to me with their questions or dinosaur egg-like circular rocks. <laughs> and, um, and also write me and let me know what you think of the book. Well, Dr. Jing May O'Connor, Thank you so much for your time tonight. And thank you for telling us all about you and your and your passion and uh, and which is also your career. It's been so wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much, Matt. It was a pleasure to be here. And thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, and thank you at home. <laughs>